Hi, welcome. Thank you all for joining us uh, for what promises to be a thought provoking debate about parallel proceedings in investment arbitration. Uh, first and foremost, a huge thank you to ASIL and in particular, uh, the mastermind behind this session, Ben Love, for making it possible. Thank you, Ben. Now, my name is Lindsay Gastrell, and I'm honored to be your moderator for this session. Uh, in a moment, I will get to introducing our extraordinary speakers and tell you a bit more about the motion that is up for debate. But first, just a, a few quick words about how this unique session will work. So it's a debate, and we not only have two superbly qualified debaters, but we also have an esteemed three-member tribunal that will be hearing the arguments. And so we'll begin the debate with a 10-minute opening statement from each side, followed by 10 minutes of tribunal questions, and then a five-minute rebuttal from each side. And at that point, the tribunal will discuss the issues you know, in front of the audience and render its decision. But the real judge here today is you, the audience. Uh, after I introduce the motion, you'll have an opportunity to vote for or against it. And I'm going to hold on to those results. Uh, you'll have a second opportunity to vote after hearing from the debaters. And so you can see by comparing the results of the two votes, we'll be able to see which of them was able to change the most minds. Now, your Q&A box, um, I'm sure you know how to use it. Please do, uh, especially if you have questions for the debaters. Uh, please share them, and the tribunal can pick up on those during the question period. So let's get to it. The motion that you'll be asked to vote on in a moment is yes or no to this statement. Parallel proceedings in investment arbitration are abusive and should be banned. So just a tiny bit of background. Uh, investment treaties, as we know, grant foreign investors certain substantive rights as well as direct remedies for enforcing those rights. And most notably, that's access to international arbitration. But those rights are not granted to the investor in a vacuum. They may be in addition to domestic law rights, contractual rights, and when a foreign investment is made through a multi-level corporate structure, as is often the case, uh, different entities in the chain may have rights under different investment treaties. So what is the result? Well, when the state adopts a measure that interferes with the investment, the investor now has many different avenues through which to seek redress. And you know it may choose one, but it may choose more than one. And so you can have a typical example of you know, a domestic subsidiary brings a domestic lawsuit maybe also a contractual claim against state entities. And then you could have a direct parent that brings a claim against the state under one treaty and perhaps an indirect shareholder that, of a different nationality that brings a claim under a different treaty. So you can see now the investor has just made use of the various rights afforded to it and has increased its chances of prevailing in at least one of the four, which is great, right? Well, not if you're a state uh, and you're forced to defend against multiple claims arising out of the same set of facts, you know, racking up legal fees, being dragged from hearing to hearing. Uh, from this perspective, parallel proceedings are not only chaotic, but they distort the balance of rights. What could be more prejudicial and abusive, right? Not to mention that parallel proceedings threaten the legitimacy of the entire investor state settlement system. Uh, so what is a tribunal to do? And perhaps more importantly, the question is, what can a tribunal do? Isn't the investor's right to bring a claim which is expressly set out in the treaty the end of the story, right? Arbitrators shouldn't be permitted to throw out a valid claim just because they don't like it. Or has the claimant sort of forfeited that right by exercising it in an abusive way? Should the tribunal find the claims to be an abusive process and therefore inadmissible, as we saw in Oristan v. Algeria? So these are the issues, these are the complexities and conundrums associated, associated with parallel proceedings are popping up more and more in the cases, and they've been identified as an area of concern at UNSATRA Working Group 3, which is focused on the reform of investor state dispute settlement. 
But more importantly, for present purposes, these issues are on the table for debate today. And so now it's over to you, the audience, to vote on the motion. And can I ask you, um, Brandon, could you pull up our first poll, please? And it, the members of the audience, uh, for this purpose, I think you'll be able to click on the Q&A box, I'm told, and you will see the poll. And I'll just give you a second there. Um, what is your view coming in off the street? Yes or no, parallel proceedings in investment arbitration are abusive and should be banned. And like I said, I don't see that poll, but I assume that it's available there for you. Um, and like I said, we'll hold on to these results and we will reveal them after you've had a second chance to vote, having heard from the debaters. So, arguing in support of the motion, we have Mr. Sam Wordsworth QC, a member of Essex Court Chambers. Sam is an expert in public international law, having literally written the book and actually two books. He is one of the co-authors of Halsbury's International Law and Foreign Relations and the forthcoming Oppenheim's International Law. Now, the list of cases in which Sam has acted as counsel before the ICJ is much too long to recite here, uh, but he's also regularly instructed in investment treaty arbitrations and teaches on the subject as a visiting professor at King's College London. And opposing the motion, we have Professor Jan Paulson, a name that is no doubt familiar to you. As counsel, arbitrator, and scholar, Jan has profoundly influenced the field of arbitration. He led the international arbitration practice at Freshfields before forming Three Crowns, and he's recently retired to practice independently. Um, if you want to know the great cases in recent arbitration history, you can just use Jan CV as a guide. And his many impactful publications include most recently the book, The Unruly Notion of Abuse of Rights. Turning now to our esteemed panel of arbitrators, we have Ms. Ms. Maria Godseritsa. She is the head of the arbitration department of the Ministry of Justice in Georgia. And in this role, she represents Georgia in investment treaty arbitrations, as well as in UNCITRA Working Group 3. So we're privileged to be able to draw on her extensive practical experience. And sitting with Miriam is Ms. Colleen Mowad. She's a partner at Chaffetz Lindsay here where I am in New York. Uh, she has 20 years of experience representing clients in both commercial and investment treaty arbitration, and she is recognized by, trust me, just there's countless rankings, uh, including as a global thought leader in arbitration. And she's also the vice chair of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR. Finally, chairing the tribunal is Professor Pierre Mayer, another household name in the field of arbitration. He is one of those great renowned arbitrators who often presides investment treaty tribunals, as he's doing here for us today. Uh, and he also sits in large complex commercial cases. He's a member of the International Law Institute and has taught for decades at Paris One, the Sorbonne, where he is an emeritus professor. Um, just a final note before I turn it over to the speakers. Um, the views that are expressed here today are for the sole purpose of this event, and they correspond to assigned roles. So please, they shouldn't be attributed to any of the individual speakers. Um, that is plenty for me. I will turn it over now to uh, our president, uh, Professor Mayer. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for this introduction, uh, which sets the scene and uh, describes the problems. Uh, we'll have the solutions now. Uh, we'll have the debate. And uh, first, uh, Mr. Wordsworth, you have the floor for the uh, positive answer to the uh, uh, motion. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Sometime around 480 BCE, Heraclitus observed that you can't step into the same river twice. And indeed, applying a strict identity test, it's true, you can't. When you put your foot back in for the second time, the water has flowed on. 
and the river is not quite the same. Sometime around October 2003, which in terms of the development of investment treaty arbitration is not materially more recent, the two tribunals in the CME and Lauda cases showed that they were able to agree on one thing, that is the application of a similarly strict approach to identity. Hence, there was no abuse in two claimants in the same ownership chain, bringing virtually identical claims under BITs that however substantially similar were correctly to be seen as separate. Leaving to one side the inconvenient fact that the Czech Republic had not assisted its position by a refusal to consolidate, most commentators considered that outcome to be deeply problematic. Intuitively, investors, like claimants more generally, must be bound by the rule that you can't take two bites out of the same cherry. And here, the two bites resulted in one successful defense by the Czech Republic and one bill for $260 million. At the same time, however, the difficulty was and is that the no two bites rule ultimately derives from the laws of physics. While the legal manifestations of the rule, most obviously the rules on lis alibi pendens and res judicata, have often been understood as requiring satisfaction of a strict triple identity test. But in the years since CME and Lauda, an intense spotlight has been shone on the potential for abuse, both in investment arbitration and more broadly, with the ICJ recognizing recently in Equatorial Guinea and France that in exceptional circumstances, a claim based on a valid title of jurisdiction can be rejected on the ground of abuse of process. And I read Professor Paulson's important new monograph on abuse of rights as being to the same effect. So even absent a specific rule in an investment treaty, a tribunal applying international law today has a much more well-established basis for declining to hear a parallel claim if there is an abuse of process. And it's not just that there is a rule apt to ban parallel proceedings, it is a rule that has been applied and with persuasive force by the notably distinguished tribunals in Oroscom and Ampel. The correct appreciation now is that parallel proceedings not so much should be, but are abusive and hence banned. And the two questions for today are really what is meant by parallel and what can be meant by banned. Of course, these are difficult questions for a 10 minute slot, but in brief terms, it would be rare for there to be sufficient and therefore abusive parallelism between claims that stem from separate legal orders, that is international law and domestic law, most obviously where a claimant seeks to bring a treaty claim and a contract claim before another forum. Landmark cases like Vivendi 1 have demonstrated how such claims are legally and materially separate, despite whatever overlaps there may be on the facts. And there are multiple other rules that may be applicable to regulate and manage overlapping treaty and contract claims. Similarly, parallel claims concerning different though related areas of international law appear unlikely to be abusive. For example, where a claim brought under a human rights treaty is accompanied by a claim under a BIT, as in the UCOS cases. As the ICJ has noted in Ukraine and Russia and various other recent cases, the fact that a dispute before it forms part of a complex situation that includes various matters and various treaties cannot lead the court to decline to resolve that dispute provided that the parties have recognized its jurisdiction to do so, and the conditions for the exercise of jurisdiction are met. So why would that approach not apply where legally separate entities in a corporate chain bring claims under two separate investment treaties? Why should that be seen as parallel and abusive? One answer, as follows from the Oroscom Award, lies in the very purpose of investment treaties, which as the tribunal aptly explained, exists to promote the economic development of the host state 
and to protect the investments made by foreigners that are expected to contribute to such development. And it follows that if the protection is sought at one level of the vertical chain, and in particular at the first level of foreign shareholding, that purpose is fulfilled. The purpose is not served by allowing other entities in the vertical chain controlled by the same shareholder to seek protection for the same harm inflicted on the investment, quite to the contrary. And for those that are concerned that this might depend on a tribunal's subjective appreciation as to the general purpose of investment treaties, the same basic reasoning could be made by reference to the specific object and purpose of the specific investment treaty that the tribunal is mandated to interpret and apply. On either route, the abuse is to be found in the initiation of multiple proceedings to recover for the same economic harm entailing the exercise of rights for purposes that are alien to those for which these rights were established. The second but consistent answer is to be found in Ampar, where it was held that it was an abusive process for what was in substance the same claim to be pursued on the merits before two investment treaty tribunals. Reference was made to RSM and Granada and the Apotex Holdings case, both of which accepted that two entities within the same corporate chain were in privity of interest. Moreover, in Apotex, it was not open to the shareholder to rely on an intermediate company to establish ownership of the protected investment, whilst at the same time seeking to distance itself from that company when it came to a raised judicata. And what these two cases are doing, and what Ampal is also doing, is recognizing the unique jurisdictional and substantive protections that quite specifically the investment treaty accords to different legal entities within the same corporate chain and approaching the issues of identity and abuse with those unique features in mind. Ultimately, what the tribunal in Ampal did was to offer the shareholder a choice to pursue its claim or that of the intermediate company, but not both. And that is an apt demonstration of why one has to be a little wary of words like banned. The issues on abusive process concern admissibility, not jurisdiction, and there may be many appropriate means to address the impermissible. And in this respect, one notes how Answer Trial Working Group 3, in its current focus on multiple proceedings, appears to be looking at developing what one delegate called a detailed toolbox. And within that toolbox, the working group is looking at tools such as orders to stay or suspend and the benefits of consolidation, as well as the possibilities for model treaty clauses, including waivers and the like. And while some states have or will wish to put into treaty form how to regulate overlapping claims, such as at Article 8.24 of CETA, I note from the working group's report that while there was a general support for elaborating on the notion of abuse of process or of claim, including the notion of double recovery in ISDS, it was cautioned that a certain level of flexibility should be provided to ISDS tribunals in applying that notion to achieve effective control over multiple proceedings. Will such elaboration be useful? No doubt. But the point for now is that the concept of abusive process and its potential applicability in the context of parallel proceedings has become firmly established and already allows for a certain level of flexibility, as aptly deployed in Ampal in putting the claimant to an election. And to conclude, the real message from Heraclitus is not, of course, that strict identity is always legally significant but rather that time and with it legal thinking and understanding of how concepts such as abuse apply in this very specialized field is always moving on. A ban, or whatever one might choose to call it, is not only essential, it has already been put in place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wordsworth. Now we are going to hear the defense of the opposite view by uh, Professor Jan Paulsen. Thank you. Yeah. 
whenever you ask a yes or no question of a group of people, um, you're likely not to get unanimous answer, uh, no matter how clear the proposition is. I don't know why that is, really. Maybe it's because some people are want to be agreeable, and no matter how absurd the proposition is, some of them will say yes, because they just inherently want to be agreeable. Or even if it's um, one that uh, is a hopeless proposition, there are some people who say no because they like to say no, and they want to uh, argue about things. Um, this, so I assume some of you who are listening have voted wrong already, um, and you uh, need to understand that there is no way this proposition can um, possibly be answered in the affirmative. Uh, consider the, the wording, parallel proceedings in investment arbitration are abusive and should be banned. Uh, one problem is that the word parallel has no meaningful content, and it certainly doesn't have any inherent pejorative meaning. So it really doesn't get us that far to coin this particular expression. But if you, want, if you wanted something agreeable that you could say yes to, uh, the proposition could be corrected, uh, very significantly so, and we'd say parallel proceedings in investment arbitration are not necessarily abusive and should not be banned unless they are abusive. That would be fine. But we can't fiddle. You have the proposition that you have, and you can't possibly say yes uh, to this one. Um, one initial uh, problem with it, if you're going to say yes, you have to consider the fact that it's parallel proceedings in investment arbitration are abusive. But if they are abusive in investment arbitration, it's because there's something wicked about them and they must be abusive in all kinds of arbitration. So you have to make good on that one as well, uh, unless you think that non-investment arbitration somehow uh, are uh, inherently tolerant of abuse, and that's fine. And then we're in some particularly sacrosanct ground here. Um, so um, why can't you possibly say yes to this? How many parallel investment arbitrations are there? How many um, arbitrations are pending before exit? 295. Uh, I don't know how many at the PCA or Pure Ad Hoc or the SEC and so forth. I guess they're all parallel. And we're going to ban them because they're parallel. But what meaning is there in this word? That can't be right. And some people, I, said, I suppose, would say that'd be a good thing. Most of them should be banned because so many of them um, involve uh, trying to generate an understanding of the word fair. And we can have unpredictable results. And therefore, we should really only have one case. And one tribunal will decide the meaning of fair. And we'll wait 10 years and find out what that word means. And then others can go ahead and decide very quickly because they'll have a handy definition of the word fair. It's a bit of a fantasy uh, world. Uh, so uh, you might say, this is, uh, Mr. Paulson, this is uh, silly. Uh, surely, um, it's, we all know that it, it, it must have meant uh, same cases being brought at the same time by the same parties. Well. The proposition doesn't say so, but even if that were true, the same parties may have different claims. Uh, and the fact that they're the same parties involved is not conclusive and can't possibly be conclusive. Um, well, uh, you hear that this would be a good rule because it will uh, militate against double recovery. Well, why don't we get granular and say, um, uh, cases that uh, run the risk of uh, eventuating in double recovery uh, or involve uh, the same ultimate beneficial owners of the rights that are being assessed should not be allowed. That would be interesting and that would be fine and we could probably come up with that kind of a formulation. But simply parallel doesn't, uh, doesn't really work. Um, Mr. Wordsworth was kind enough to mention the book I wrote on abuse of right. Uh, I, I'd like to clarify that uh, in that book, you will see I have no problem with the notion of abuse of process. Uh, that's something different. Abuse of process involves an adjudicator's considering uh, 
whether there is an abuse of the proceedings before him or her. That's an inherent function, that's an inherent matter of the judicial function. Um, to put it a bit provocatively, the judge knows abuse of process when he sees it, because the judge is the master of the process. But abuse of right involves an infinite number of rights, and no human being can be a specialist in everything and know it when he sees it, and know when there's an abuse. Um, my research on the subject uh, shows that judges, I mean judicial officers of states, uh, don't at all welcome the uh, notion of abuse of right as something which they should apply because it's too open-ended. and They don't know what will happen on appeal and they, they fear accusations of arbitrariness. Uh, so in specific areas of the law, substantive areas of the law, we want more granular definitions and we want to know where we stand. Um, but now we have a new animal, parallel. Somehow the word parallel is bad. Um, why do we need to decide that parallel is abusive? Uh, we can, as with respect to other notions, like we don't want double recovery, we don't want people with the same, with people with the ultimate same beneficial interest to pursue um, uh, several claims at once. We have we have these means already at our disposal. Uh, to, uh, to object to such things. Uh, national law has been dealing with this for a long time. The common law knows it in various, in various uh, forms of estoppel. Um, the French um, uh, Court of Cassation has seen the problem uh, where it's referred to as the, um, uh, the rule of the concentration de moyens. If you have uh, uh, arguments in support of a claim, you cannot bring one or two of them and keep a few in, in, in reserve and start over again uh, with, it, with a second claim. You have to concentrate the moyen, the arguments that you have in a particular case. Uh, if you have different claims, you can bring different cases, but not arguments. Um, when you get down into details about how this works out, and the difference, for example, with between claimants and, and respondents, uh, and respondents who didn't raise an argument which they could have raised and, and now seeks to raise it on appeal, well, that is not addressed to Jakarta because it wasn't raised at all. That, that creates its own specific problems. International law, the idea of a general principle of, of, of transnational, international law that should be uh, applied in all cases really doesn't lend itself uh, to resolving these kinds of uh, complicated questions. And so we are left with the idea that parallel uh, in this proposition is something which is abusive and we know it when we see it, even though some of the cases that arise really don't look as though they have a problem of parallelism at all. Uh, consider the case of two joint venture part parties who have created a company in a country and that company uh, is uh, treated in a particular way which it finds objectionable and a state is, a case is brought against the state. Um, it happens that the two partners have a falling out and one of them becomes a great friend of the local government and settles its difficult, its, its problem uh, and goes ahead and gets other advantageous deals perhaps, but the problem is resolved with respect to that joint venture partner. Uh, we now have the other joint venture partner who is still not uh, uh, getting along with the local government, which gives it no redress, no friendly settlement, um, and it wants to bring a case. It now brings a case as somebody whose shareholding in that country has been dealt with poorly. That's not a parallel proceeding, that's a sequential proceeding. And what's wrong with it? What is wrong with it? Uh, there is uh, no issue of double recovery. Uh, and above all, there's no res judicata, there was a settlement. Uh, so I fear that by this kind of a generalization, uh, we get into great difficulty and we put our arbitrators in the situation of wondering whether they uh, know it when they see it. And uh, that res results in a great difficulty of arbitrary decisions. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, thanks to both. Uh, both very convincing, of course, uh, but we'll have to make a choice and the audience will have to make a choice. Um, so we have 10 minutes for our questions, which means no more than three minutes for each of us. And uh, it starts with Mariam. Uh, please, your questions, or oh, one question. Sometimes the answer takes the three minutes, but let's see. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank parties for very thought-provoking uh, um, submissions. I would have one uh, short question to each party. Uh, I will start with uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Wordsworth. Uh, so um, you seem to be very positive in arguing that the um, principle of um, abuse of process seems to be very well established already in um, investor state dispute settlement. Um, however, there could be only a couple of cases uh, that we could name where tribunals felt empowered to take a strong position on this issue. What do you think is a problem and what should tribunals do to be able to um, more effectively approach this um, issue um, uh, by using existing legal principles? And you mentioned that uh, tribunals are still interpreting identity test quite strictly with respect to these standards, for instance. And then one question for uh, Mr. Paulson. Um, if I understood correctly, Mr. Paulson, you are not excluding that there could be uh, cases of parallel proceedings which could in fact um, create some harms um, and maybe those concerns that have been voiced in international circles with respect to double recovery, conflicting decisions, posing threat to the legitimacy of the system might be correct, but what you are suggesting is that um, this concept of parallel or multiple proceedings might be very wide and encompass some uh, quite legitimate cases which should not be considered abusive. Could you elaborate more what kind of uh, parallel or multiple proceedings you would consider uh, abusive or problematic? Thank you. Short answers by both of you. Well, the the answer to the question given uh, asked of me is that there are indeed two recent cases that are showing how abuse of process provides the correct answer um, to cases of of parallel proceedings. Um, in terms of tribunals in other cases continuing to apply um, the triple identity cases over strictly. But I think one has to be rather careful there because triple identity um, is applied in multiple different circumstances. And what one sees in places like RSM and Apotex, in fact, is a very uh, carefully restricted application of the triple identity test and seeing how it applies in the very specific context of investment treaties. So in actual fact, I think the cases on application of triple identity tests are moving hand in hand with the cases on abuse of process. Yeah. Um, I, I gave, um, I think three examples, uh, which uh, I can enumerate, um, and each of them uh, would defeat a particular way of proceeding by claimants in different cases uh, without talking about uh, parallel proceeding. One is double recovery, so we need to put on our thinking hats and figure out how how far that extends and work out in a granular way what that means. Um, no uh, claims uh, by parties that have ultimately the same beneficial interest. And I suppose you could also imagine um, harassment uh, of a respondent for to put political pressure on it uh, and, 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 and uh, to sort of set the stage for uh, advantageous negotiations. I, I find that 
rather unlikely because it's a very expensive thing to do. But I suppose it could happen, uh, and and you would uh, you would you, you would, and and then I wouldn't say this is wrong because it's parallel. Uh, I would say that this this is an abuse of process, and again, abuse of process to distinguish uh, to distinguish that from uh, uh, from abuse of right is something which I consider that the adjudicator knows when he sees. So when somebody says we well, respect to, to uh, the discovery application, um, that is vexatious uh, and oppressive, and the judge agrees or disagrees. Well, the judge knows vexation and, and oppressive because he is the judge of procedure. But if you're talking about the myriad other fields of substantive rights, uh, abuse of rights is not helpful. Thank you. Um, Kaline? Thank you, uh, Pierre. I will also limit myself to one question. For, for each uh, advocate. Uh, Mr. Wordsworth, you, you talked about the triple identity test and the need for flexibility for that test. Uh, and I just was hoping that you could address that a little bit more about what is the content of that test? Because without clarity, I think there is a risk that in fact it encourages multiple claimants who may not know whether or not they're the right party or whether the claims might be abusive. Was it 80% shareholding or 100% shareholding or somewhere in the middle? Um, and so it might actually, without the clarity, might um, might invite more claims, in fact, um, until there is such clarity. So, that's, so that was one question for Mr. Woodsworth. And, and for Mr. Paulson, if you could address, um, I think, a, an argument that Mr. Woodsworth alluded to and mentioned about the legitimacy on the ISDS system as a whole and how you see the, the you know, parallel proceedings moving forward within the confines that you've described, how that interplays with, uh, with this legitimacy question that, that we're facing today. Thank you very much. I mean, in terms of a triple identity test, I want to emphasize that the, the tribunal has to be looking at the question of what is abusive. It shouldn't be looking at application of strict triple identity tests that derive ultimately from domestic law and domestic legal concepts like lis alibi pendants. Now, the, the nub of your question is really well, hang on a sec, supposing there isn't strict identity between claimants and you have uh, different claimants who 80% ownership instead of 100% ownership. And thus one could have the sort of situation where you have the 20% uh, the different owner of a joint venture or whatever it might, know, might be, not being able to bring its claim. And that would be uh, an incorrect application of the abusive process doctrine. Um, and that, of course, simply requires the tribunal uh, to be focusing precisely on identity of claimants. There's no question that you have to identify a beneficial claimant the beneficial ownership that is in 100% ownership so far as concerns a particular claim. But what that can mean, as in the Alpal, Ampal case, is that you're not saying there is a complete overlap in terms of these two potentially parallel claims. In fact, the overlap only applies with respect to 12.5% of the, the relevant shareholding. So all that is required is a very close focus by the tribunal and what is and what is it not in genuinely common ownership. In terms of consequence on perceptions of legitimacy, as I've said, uh, I uh, have no difficulty with the idea that abusive claims should be, uh, should be uh, resisted. Uh, I don't think the notion of this new idea of a buzzword of parallel proceedings, uh, which are just far too indeterminate to be of any use whatsoever. Uh, as um, if one invokes the Oraskam case as an example, um, it was a case that was begun and it ended because one of the parties settled. Uh, then you have a second case started by the party that wasn't able to settle. That's sequential. 
that's not parallel, so it doesn't help at all to, 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 uh, to refer to it in, in that sense. What we need to do is to look at it and see whether there was anything abusive about that particular case uh, and to um, establish criteria for which, for, for which the, that, that, that is the case. Uh, and, and there I have no difficulty at all with uh, insisting uh, and, and hence my reformulation uh, of the proposition. Parallel proceedings are not necessarily abusive and should not, not be banned unless they are. I think we all agree that they may be. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, uh, it seems that I have no time for my questions unless you, you say differently. Uh, Professor Mayer, perhaps uh, you can ask one question now and we'll have a little bit less time at the end. Uh, and that's a question for, um, for Sam Wellsworth. Um, do you make a distinction between uh, parallel proceedings in a chain of uh, companies um, and parallel proceedings uh, brought by two joint ventures, one uh, uh, under a different uh, BIT. In the, the second situation, uh, do you think there is uh, abuse of process? No, there's an issue for consolidation, but it's very unlikely that there's an abusive process because the two joint venturers are not pursuing a claim for the same economic harm. And that's what was at issue in, in cases like Oroscom and Ampol. As I understand your question, you have joint venture A pursuing, let's say, 50% of the harm, and joint venture B also pursuing 50% of that harm. In an ideal world, the cases are heard together, but that's not necessary, and it is a potential problem in the system that consolidation is not possible, unless the parties agree. But I yeah. don't see abuse. Suppose you said first, well, it's a case for consolidation. Suppose that no consolidation is, is possible, which may very well happen. So what would you say? Is there abuse or, or not? No, there's no abuse because it's a different economic harm, as I see it, that is that uh, the two different joint ventures uh, are seeking to recover. In spite of the possibility of contradiction between the awards on the same facts. Correct. That is a, a contradiction that reflects a defect in the system. And that's why one of the things the work in Group 3 is looking at is, is consolidation. But nonetheless, I think it's difficult to say it's an abusive process for two separate joint venturers to wish to bring separate claims. Thank you. Thank you. I had several questions for Jan, but uh, that will be some other time or some other day. <laughs> okay, so now we have returned to the uh, rebuttal uh, session. Uh, Sam Wordsworth first. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. President. I mean, what one of the, the key points that Professor Paulson is making is that the, the term parallel has no meaningful content. Um, and in a sense, one, one can agree, but that doesn't assist him in his argument because what I've tried to do in opening is to show how certain forms of parallelism are legally meaningful in this particular context of abuse and certain are less meaningful because they're unlikely to lead to a situation of abuse. Hence the examples I gave of um, claims brought separately under contract and treaty where different legal orders are in play. Um, Professor Paulson also said, well, there are means at a tribunal's disposal to ensure that there is no double recovery um, in a series of, in a given case. Um, and also there are means available to limit claims to one beneficial owner. Um, that I think is certainly true, at least as a matter of 
strict legal content, so far as concerns double recovery, because the tribunal will be applying the horse or factory standard and it can only make the claimant whole um, and won't permit it to recover twice. So as a, a useful principle for the tribunal, that is there. But as to a, an available tool for saying a claim must be limited to one beneficial owner in the same chain, what is that tool? That tool is abuse of process. I'm not aware of there being any other um, reasonably available tool. Um, it's said that international law does not lend itself uh, to resolving these problems. Well, I, I find that difficult to agree with because one looks at the International Court of Justice, which we do still all look at as a touchstone um, in the investment treaty world. And there they are spelling out in terms that abusive process uh, is an available tool. Um, and the question is how it applies in this specific context of investment treaties. Um, some points were being made by reference to the Oroscom case, but, but that's simply a question that's being raised as to the application of the abuse of process on the facts of a particular case. Now, the tribunal considered that there was indeed an abuse of process because the a company owned by the claimant had initially brought a claim, had then divested itself of that claim, uh, selling it to a third party who entered into a settlement agreement, which according to the tribunal, and one can readily understand that, meant that that claim was settled. When the claimant later brings a new claim, one might say, indeed, it is abusive. But that's a point of detail which has to be left to the tribunal in the individual case to decide. And that's why abusive process is such a useful doctrine because it allows, it gives a framework within which the tribunal can focus on the very specific facts before it and identify abuse, no abuse. Thank you. Professor Paulson. Members of the tribunal, with the greatest respect, may I say that you are not entitled to change the question and say that you don't like the abusive process and therefore you will vote in favor of the proposition which is put. It is put the way it is put. Now, listening to my friend, Mr. Wordsworth, uh, it comes back to me that he is always uh, the fairest of opponents. He never overstates his arguments and he never misstates his opponent's arguments. It's marvelous and it's miraculous that he still seems to win most of his cases. Uh, in this case, he has been absolutely fair and uh, it kills him in this instance uh, in two ways. Uh, he has given very thoughtful indications of a number of things that uh, are not second bites, are not abusive, uh, and are actually legi uh, 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 legitimate parallel claims. Uh, well, I take that on board. Uh, and note that he therefore is reduced to talking about something which he calls truly parallel claims. Now, those are ones that are bad because they are truly parallel. This really doesn't uh, help us uh, one bit. Uh, because it's just a way of, of using some sort of a code to get where you want to go. Uh, once again, we all agree, uh, it seems, uh, that uh, abuse of process should not be allowed. That is within the er inherent jurisdiction and authority, put it that way, of adjudicators. And what we should spend our time doing is to define in, in a granular and predictable way what does or does not constitute abuse. Parallel. Thank you. And uh, now we have the poll, the second poll, I think. That's right. So if I could ask Brandon to please pull up for the audience uh, this, the poll, it will be the exact same question that you had at the beginning. Uh, and you can access that through the Q&A box. So now that you've heard from our debaters, yes or no, parallel proceedings in investment arbitration 
are abusive and should be banned. And I will let you know as soon as I receive the results from our ASOL team and report back on who has changed the most minds. In the meantime, uh, it may take a moment. So I, I don't know, Mr. President, would you like to go ahead and start the conversation with the tribunal and I'll let you know when the poll is ready? Okay, you mean uh, with within our own group or we're openly? Openly. Openly. Um, yes, yes, of course. Uh, so, uh, Mariam, um, having heard both uh, speakers, uh, what's your view? Uh, thank you. In the interest of time, I will limit myself to three points. So first, it seems to be a general consensus um, among the users of the system that certain type of parallel proceedings are raising legitimate concerns are, and are susceptible to serious harm, not only to a particular case, uh, but also to the legitimacy of the entire system. Um, my second point would be that having heard uh, the submissions of the parties, there could be cases where uh, proceedings brought in parallel are the legitimate exercise of the legal remedies in the hands of the respective parties. So maybe outright ban of the parallel proceedings under very vague concept of parallel or multiple, as they refer to it in anti fraud Working Group 3, or under very wide and vague concepts of abusive would not be uh, right. And maybe more per correct approach would be to define uh, what type of proceedings uh, could be abusive uh, and when the tribunals should apply the um, concept of abusive process. And uh, finally, um, from today's perspective, it seems that tribunals still do not feel empowered to uh, take strong position against the abusive process maybe conservative approach to the interpretation of existing legal concepts and, and principles doesn't help, like strict uh, application of triple identity test, for instance. Uh, so um, maybe some reform is, is warranted and some um, more flexible uh, and evolutionary uh, interpretation uh, of the legal uh, principles uh, from the tribunals um, are, uh, are warranted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariam. Um, Kaline? Um, so I, I agree with actually Mariam's first point about there seems to be consensus or agreement that there are certain types of proceedings that would be abusive versus those that would not be. And, and the common ground from, from our advocates about um, common ownership, ultimate beneficial ownership, double recovery as those being sort of parameters to this discussion. Um, I also think that, um, you know, that there's, there's a question of, uh, we talked to Mr. Woodward mentioned the 12 and a half percent in, in MPAL and sort of the tribunal really honing in to figure out what was overlapping. Um, and then, you know, taking note of Mr. Paulson's view that, you know, I, I, I see it, I see abuse, I know abuse when I see it, um, and sort of leaving it to the tribunals to make that assessment, as opposed to having a, a, a complete bar um, seems to be Common ground may be too strong, but I think there there is some similarities in the positions. I, and and uh, I, I I'm very um, sympathetic to the the notion that we really need to define we need to define triple identity tests. We need to define what is abusive and get granular, um, like Mr. Balsam mentioned. Because part of it is also in the treaties, the language of the BITs that have opened up that door by allowing indirect shareholders to bring claims. Um, States perhaps should be held to the terms of their treaties, and um, and if not, then we need to either refine those treaties, as Working Group Three is looking into, and there are, what are the tools that are available to do that, or define with more granularity um, where the instances where we would we will put up a, a bar because because it just extends beyond what was the intent and the purpose of these treaties. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Pierre. No, uh, thank you. Um... I don't know, Lindsay, do we have now the poll and I speak afterwards or I speak now? How about we give the audience 
uh, the audience's judgment first, and then you can render the tribunal's decision after. So uh, we have an interesting result here. Our first, uh, the first poll, the results were 56% in favor of the motion and 44% opposed. So we had a slight majority in favor. That is switched in our second poll. And we now have a slight majority against with 45% voting in favor of the motion and 55% voting against. So for this debate, it is the opposing, the, the team opposing the motion that has prevailed. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I understand the, the switch. And I think the reason is that, and, and Jan Paulson is entirely right, and by the way, Sam Wordsworth does not disagree with that, that the question is put in a much too broad fashion. And you have to distinguish between various situations. It seems that we all agree, uh, in fact, uh, on this. And that's why you cannot accept the proposition. You cannot accept it. It's too broad. Um, and also, not only because the situations are, are, are different, for instance, joint, joint ventures or chain of ownership are different, uh, but also there may be tools other than abuse of process in some cases. Um, and um, I know personally, and I'm probably not the, the only one, that uh, Jan Paulson doesn't like the very notion of abuse of rights and even wrote a book uh, to demonstrate uh, is you. Um, on this last point, uh, I think I personally would disagree. And I, I think and that in some situations, there's no other way than having recourse to the uh, notion of abuse of process to uh, avoid uh, double recovery. Uh, well, in the case of a chain of um, of uh, companies, um, if the, uh, the company below, the, the direct investor, uh, is going or may be going to win, and so the harm will be uh, repair, repaired, reco the, uh, recovered, uh, then the mother company should not receive anything. But if you look only, uh, you are the tribunal, uh, and the claim is brought by the mother company, which claims for the, its whole harm, which may be 100%, by the way, uh, then how can you, on what basis can you tell that claimant there's something wrong, there's a risk that there be double recovery? Um, and uh, for instance, I find that abusive. The situation, at least, is abusive. And since you are the master, being the mother company, having control, there is abuse of process. And for instance, um, because we don't know what is the outcome of the, the other claim, the claim by the uh, direct investor, the daughter, then I suspend, for instance. I suspend the proceedings to see what happens, because there must not be double recovery. And I don't see any other way to avoid it. Um, now, that's, well, that was my view. <laughs> now, if I try to uh, make a synthesis of, the, uh, of what the three members of the tribunal said, I, and the simple answer is that we think that the motion should be dismissed. Well, uh, that speaks clearly. I think now we have uh, solved all the problems of parallel proceedings and abusive process in investment arbitration, so we can all go uh, celebrate. I'm told to remind everyone, and this is important, the, the conversation is not over. There is a continuing the conversation link uh, that the audience should have received. And so if you are so inclined, please uh, join after.
Uh, thank you very much for joining and thanks to all the speakers.